The title of my sermon, Purposeful Puzzling Profundity, is actually uh, a way of making fun of myself for my love of alliteration and also kind of poking fun at myself for just how confusing this scripture is to me and how much I've grappled with it and struggled with it. Now, presumably, from Jesus' point of view, parables are purposeful. To us, they often seem puzzling. However, if we have ears to hear, they can be profound. Parables provoke and poke. That is, they punch our buttons, don't they? They're usually more confrontational than comforting, and they get us thinking and questioning. And that's the point. The more straightforward a parable is, the more we think we understand it, the more we probably need to look and see if there's something we're missing. Now, the good news is the power of this passage does not depend upon my understanding it, just as the power of God's kingdom does not depend upon our belief in it, right? Because if we can seek to understand what this text is saying, maybe in the seeking we will find. I heard that phrase somewhere before. Now, here is the thing about parables. There is usually a pretty easy meaning that you can get from them, that can have good and impactful, you know, ramifications for your life. For example, in the parable of the sower, you can read it and see yourself, perhaps, as the sower, and realize that as you share the good news of God out in the world, as you toss the seed of the gospel here and there, it's going to fall on different soils. And your job is just to throw the seed everywhere and see where it lands and if it takes, and it's not up to you as to whether it takes, right? Your job is just to spread the word. You can also read the parable of the sower and think about yourself as one of the different kinds of soil. Are you the path or the rocky ground, the the thorns or the fertile soil? You can kind of take stock of where you are in your life and evaluate if there's some changes you could make to maybe make yourself more receptive to how God is working in your life. In both of these instances, we're invited to pay attention to the environments around us, right? It is interesting, though, that soil types are kind of entrenched in their own ways. They can't make themselves fertile. They're either rocky or rich or under shade or out in the sun, near a water source or out in the desert. And it kind of begs the question, can we change the soil of our lives, a.k.a. the circumstances of our lives? To what extent can we change how a seed lands and grows The parable invites us to ask deep questions on human agency and free will and God's involvement in our lives. In the parable of the lamp, it seems pretty obvious what the message is. Lamps are meant to shine light, right? They're not meant to be hidden. Maybe the point here is to pay attention to our purpose and not hide who we are or who God is. We can't, even if we try, hide the illuminating truth of God. If we put it under a bushel basket, the light is going to seep out anyway, so we might as well put it on a lampstand for the world to see. In the parable of the scattered seed, the lesson seems to be that the kingdom of God is like someone who scatters seed and then goes to bed, goes to sleep, and then wakes up the next day shocked and amazed that all this has happened, all this growth has happened without their involvement. According to this parable, the kingdom of God surprises and shocks us, defies our expectations. Despite of our efforts and in spite of our efforts, God is always at work. And then there's the parable of the mustard seed. Great things come in small packages. We never know how God will work in and through us no matter how small we feel or how insignificant we feel. And even more, the kingdom of God is so small and insignificant at times that it might be missed or overlooked, but once full grown, its true significance becomes known. Now there's your quick rundown of all four parables. 
pick one of those and over lunch today, talk about it, see how it intersects with your life today. I actually don't want to talk about those today. What I want to talk about is all of these little comments that are in between the parables. Comments like, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Veiled references like, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables. In order that, and here Jesus quotes Isaiah, they may indeed look but not perceive, they may listen but not understand. Questions like, do you understand this parable? How are you going to understand all the rest of the parables if you don't understand this one? Statements like, for there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. And urgent declarations like, pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get. And for those who have, more will be given. And for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. What is up with that? What does that even mean? And then Mark talk, tops it off by saying, with many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as if they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. So that's great. Great for the disciples, right? I mean, Jesus speaks in code, and the disciples get this private tutoring session on the side to help them crack that code. I'm not, hap I'm not saying I'm not happy for them, but I'm kind of wondering what about the rest of us? We'd like those private tutoring sessions as well. The thing is, why is everything so secretive in this passage? Why do some get to hear and understand and others don't? And in what world is it fair where those who already have get more and those who have not get less? What is Jesus talking about? And why is he talking in this way? Does he want us to be confused and outraged? Is he trying to push our buttons? There's all kinds of theories as to why Mark's Jesus is so secretive. One of those theories is this thing called the messianic secret. In short, it just means that Jesus was probably being secretive because he knew what was at stake and that he'd be in trouble politically if, you know, he was killed before his time, before he had a chance to really sow those seeds and spread the message. So he was trying to lay low. And that's why all in those miracle stories we've heard the last couple of weeks, he was saying, shh, don't tell anyone. But the thing about saying, shh, don't tell anyone that's the fastest way to get someone to tell something, right? Maybe the point is that even Jesus himself, trying his hardest to be cryptic, can't stop the spread of the word of God. Scholar and preacher Angela Hancock kind of gets at this tension of this secrecy here, and she says, transparency is something that we value in government, in our institutions, in our relationships. We want to know what is going on and why. We deserve to know. And while we don't usually use the language of transparency, when we talk about our hopes for growth as Christian disciples, many of us have an expectation that we can and will know more than we do now about the things of God at some point in our life, right? If we pray more, if we study more, if we listen to more sermons, Right? We expect that there's going to be some kind of learning or development or maturation of our faith. We expect that we'll be able to see more clearly who God is and what God is all about day by day. We trust that when faith seeks understanding, it finds it, at least to some degree. And I think it's because of this expectation, right, that, that spiritual growth somehow progresses linearly and logically, like, say, math, right? First we learn our numbers, then we learn to add, then we learn how to multiply, and then maybe we make it to algebra, maybe to geometry, maybe to calculus. You know, there's this upward trajectory. And because we think of learning in that way, we can get frustrated with passages like this, that show us that spiritual growth is not linear, and neither is the growth of the kingdom of God. 
We want to understand what God is up to in the world. But so often, we're left with questions, with images, with seeds, not with answers, not with fully blossomed flowers of explanation. And maybe that shouldn't be surprising. The longer I grapple with scripture, the less confident I am that I actually know what it means. And yet the more I sit with scripture, the more I realize the vastness of God's word and the mystery of God's ways and the way in which this book somehow in some way speaks to my life. We see through a glass dimly, as the Apostle Paul says, about so many things, including the teachings of Jesus. And here we have affirmation that the disciples felt this way too. Brian McLaren, a popular theologian and teacher, also echoes this tension. Why did Jesus speak in parables? Why was he subtle, indirect, secretive? Because his message wasn't merely aimed at conveying information. It sought something much more important, transformation. The form of a parable helps to shape our hearts so that we get into a place where we can be in this willing, interactive relationship of trust with a teacher, in this case, Jesus. It beckons us to explore new territory. The perplexities and paradoxes of parables help form our hearts in a way that we become more humble so that we keep asking questions instead of declaring that we have the answer. In other words, a parable renders its hearers not as experts, not as know-it-alls, not as scholars, but as children, which is to say, lifelong learners. What do kids love to do? Ask questions, right? And they seem to never get tired of the questions. Mommy, why is the sky blue? After mommy musters an answer, well, what makes blue, blue? Is the blue you see the same blue that I see? And if the sky is blue, why sometimes is it pink? You know, the questions, they just kind of keep coming and keep rolling until at some point a parent might just say, because, because, because. It's just the way it is, right? The joy of children is their unknowing, their curiosity, their questions, which are at times unending. But at some point, we grow up and we stop asking these same kinds of questions about our faith and our world. We assume things just are the way they are, that they cannot change. And I think at times it make us, makes us feel more helpless than curious, more apathetic than actively engaged. You see, the form of a parable, this way of teaching, describes more than just information. It tells us something about how the heart of God works and how the kingdom of God works, that it's always revealing, always prompting. It's not just something that we can analyze, but it's a reality in which we participate. And what Jesus is doing through the use of parables, I think, is challenging us to see in a different way. You can't parse out a parable easily. It has to sit with you and work on you and speak to your life and your context in this moment at this time where you are now. And unlike a proverb, which is kind of an eternal, timeless truth, I think that a parable's message for you today won't be the same message that it has for you tomorrow. It's malleable, just like God's spirit. Parables invite us to consider this. Do we allow ourselves to play along with the parable until we see differently? Or do we just let how we see things today dictate how we play? Do we allow ourselves to let the parable change how we see things? Or is how we see things dictate what this means for us today. How open are we to maybe not understanding, but rather exploring? 
A key point in this whole passage is verse 22. For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed. Think of that word disclosed. To disclose is the opposite of close, right? Something closes, it's closing in on something. Disclose means to open up. In areas like science and rational thinking, we're all about explanations, right? We want to grasp something. And so we hone in closer and closer and we grasp it and we close in on an idea so that we can understand it. But that's not what parables do. Rather than closing in on something, parables disclose, they open up something within ourselves and they reveal something about God that we did not know before and perhaps could not know before. Something about the power of God's presence, about the way these ideas work in people, even in lives that are different than our own. And maybe that's why there are different levels of understanding or a different time and a place for a different level of understanding for any one of us. Now, I'll get it. We all like closure, right? We want things to be not complicated. We want life to be easy, and yet the reality is life isn't easy. And sometimes I think this search for closure is kind of a myth of of convenience. Whereas disclosure, this unveiling, this investigating, this surfacing, this opening up reveals something far more transformational, even though it can be challenging and inconvenient at times. We celebrate this weekend the birthday of a man who had strong beliefs and convictions and even stronger actions, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was eloquent and powerful in his speaking. Even more than his words, though, he put his body and life on the line for the poor and the discriminated against, for those who were underpaid and underemployed. He stood against systems of injustice, systems that perpetuated racism, and he stood for anything that included rather than excluded, systems that liberated rather than limited. It seems that this year, more in years past, I've read and and heard more challenging ways of thinking about how we are honoring and remembering Dr. King. Because his life had integrity, that is to say his words had the weight of action and change behind them. They weren't just nice ideas or lofty prayers, they weren't just words. We've put them on monuments of remembrance, but we've forgotten how to use them to mount up resistance for change in our world. And so when we just recite the words and talk about the dream he had for America without actually changing our ways or changing policies or actions to proactively make that dream a reality, then we just kind of appropriate his vision as a pep talk rather than imparting it as a powerful transformational tool for our society and one that we need. There was something about Dr. King that allowed us to see differently. Here in Denver, we're going to experience two demonstrations tomorrow. There's going to be the regular marade that we've had for several years. The website says that the purpose of this is to unify and educate communities and celebrate the life and work of Dr. King. And tomorrow, it's featuring Eldrin Bell who was a man who stood watch by the body of Dr. King after he was assassinated for 12 hours. He's gonna share his story and the story of other civil rights leaders and how that 12 hour time period impacted his life. Meanwhile, there's also gonna be some activists from the Colorado Poor People's Campaign, which is a local chapter of a national movement started by Dr. King back in 1967 and also the Black Lives Matter 5280 chapter, who are gonna have a demonstration protesting the city's camping ban policy at City Park. Their intention being, Dr. King stood to change the way things are in the world for the vulnerable, to protect the vulnerable, those who are displaced. So we have these two different demonstrations, one celebrating the story of one who knew Dr. King and how that story impacted his life, and one who focuses on the actions 
of Dr. King's life and what it can mean for us today. The words and stories of the man, the life and actions of the man. Both are important. Words inspire hearts. Actions change lives. Maybe the truth is somewhere in between. Not settling for just one or the other, but realizing that any of us who have ears to hear need to listen to all of these stories and all of these voices and all of these interpretations. Maybe the lesson for me in this text is that Jesus kept telling parable after parable and told so many of them because there's not one that reveals all the dimensions of who God is and what God's kingdom is all about. We need all of these parables to be challenged and to see something differently. And maybe it's only when all of our stories are combined that we get the fullness of the imago dei in the world, the image of God, the understanding of what God's kingdom is. And so we can't just have a soil here and a soil here or a seed thrown here and a seed thrown there. All of our soils matter. And then when one seed sprouts, we, we need to celebrate that, but we also need to figure out how to get seeds to grow on all the soil, right? That it's this vision of seeing the whole, not just the part. Parable after parable, we see how God wants to expand our vision. Jesus knew, I think, that some folks did not yet realize that God's kingdom was far greater than they could imagine. They couldn't quite dream the dream with him yet. They couldn't see all the trees and shrubs that were all around them. They could just see the mustard seed. What about you? What do you see? We can all throw out seeds, right? We can all recite our own dreams for the world. But how are we growing? How are we acting? It may be a mystery as to how God works. What's not a mystery is that God is at work in the world through you and through me. Maybe Jesus is purposefully puzzling so that we can be profoundly confused, forced to see things from a different perspective, from a different angle from a different lens. May our vision be open today. Amen.